Hi, I'm Linda Van Hart, Visual Arts Coordinator for Common Ground on the Hill. Welcome to our fourth gallery talk of week two. Tonight is a really special one. I'm glad you've joined us. Uh, tonight, we are having a wonderful conversation between Kabibi and Pun. Uh, they represent some cultures that are very fascinating to me. Uh, most of you know Pun as a storyteller and, and he, that is his art. Words are his art form. But he's also a collector of wonderful artifacts that are significant to his culture. Uh, and, and he's going to be talking to you and he has plenty of time tonight to share some stories with you. Take it away, Pun. Oh, well, welcome and thank you, uh, Linda. It is a joy to be here. If you don't mind, I'd like to introduce myself to you in our language. I'm a Grand River Band, Ottawa, from Michigan, uh, living in Michigan. And uh, I just always feel more comfortable if, if I can introduce myself in the language. So to do that, I will begin by what's up with the sound? Is that fixed? OK. Uh, to introduce myself, I begin by saying, I need to be Mata Sajek. And I said, hello, everyone. And then I sort of greeted the, the original people, the first people. So after greeting you, I told you my name. I said, uh, uh, So I am called Two Hawks. And I'm an Anishinaabe Odawa. I'm a member, I'm a first people, uh, Aboriginal, indigenous, and I'm of the Ottawa or the Odawa tribe. Well, I got to talk to Kabidi a little earlier this week, and, and uh, I understand that she's going to be talking about uh, some plants that are familiar to her and in, in her culture. And I thought it would be interesting if I talked about a few plants. Our most sacred plants, our most sacred medicine plants, and when I say medicine, I mean they're physical medicine, but they're also spiritual medicine. And we have four sacred, very sacred plants, and each one of those plants represents a direction. The first plant, the chief of all of the other plants, I'm taught that if you want to speak with the other plants, you speak to tobacco. And I have some tobacco here. I hope you can see this. This is uh, it's not lit very well, but this is what's called a tobacco twist. So the way you make a tobacco twist is you get the long leaves of tobacco and you take the center vein out of them. And then you roll one leaf on top of the other and you keep rolling it. And when you get that rolled into a rope, then you put another leaf and you roll that. You keep rolling and rolling and rolling. And pretty soon or after a while, you get a, a, a rope of tobacco that's about that big around. Sometimes they're a little bigger. But then you take that rope and you tie it in a knot. And that's what this is. This is a knot of tobacco. You could, if the light is right, you can see that it's all twisted up. This was what the native peoples traded with the Europeans. This is very hard. Very, this here piece, the, uh, rope is about 20, maybe 30 years old. I rolled this myself. But this, this is what we carried around with. This is how we transported tobacco. As long as it's dry and it's very tight like this, it'll stay fresh and usable for decades. So when the Europeans came, this is what we traded with them. They would take this and they would stuff it in what they called hogsheads or wooden barrels. And they'd pack it in there real tight 
It's just like any other dry food. You have to keep it dry. If it gets wet, it molds. So they would ship hogs heads, barrels full of these off to Europe. And that's how, also how we transported our tobacco. We call it a sema, a sema. We would use this for trading amongst ourselves. Now I'm an Odawa, but we always talk about that Iroquois tobacco and that Mohawk tobacco, how great it was. And we would send journeys if we weren't at war with the Mohawk and the Iroquois, we would send traders to trade with them for their tobacco. They didn't have any wild rice. We had wild rice. And so those were trade items. In many of the stories you'll hear about if you want advice from an elder, it's appropriate to take them tobacco. And now that's kind of like a contract. If you give them tobacco and they take it, they're saying, okay, I'll, I'll listen to you. I'll give you some time. And usually we pass our tobacco in little bundles like this. These are called tobacco ties. And they're ubiquitous. You go into any native's house and you'll see a bowl of them or several bowls of them all around the house. I wanna point out one little thing. You'll notice these are all tied with red twine. More red twine. And I've often wondered why, do, why the, not every tobacco tie on earth is tied with red tie, uh, twine, but the traditional way of passing these on is using this red twine. And I found out why, because that was when the European contact made contact with, with the Ottawa or the Odawa, this red twine was a trade item. Before that, we had to use sinew or we had to use leather strips. And here these people come along with this thing that's very flexible and is quite strong. And so we traded for that. And we started using it instead of sinew and instead of leather. So when you see a tobacco tie tied with red twine, you'll know that that represents that contact period, the first contact period between the Europeans and the Anishinaabe. The next uh, thing I wanna show you is uh, sage. I know you've probably all seen sage. This is a big long stick of Western sage again with the red twine, eh? And it's wrapped. It's wrapped all with red twine. And this of course is used for smudging. I'm sure you've probably seen people smudge a, a gathering of people. This is a cleanser. This cleanses the spirit, but also in your house. If you have spirits in your house, or maybe you fried a whole bunch of fish and you wanna get rid of the smell, this is what you use, huh? sage. This represents the Western direction. Tobacco uh, represents, or asema, represents the Eastern direction. So I'll move on now to uh, sweetgrass. Sweetgrass is one of our favorite. These are sacred plants. The word for uh, uh, sweetgrass is Wingush, Wingush, and it means our mother's hair. So we reckon you've heard that phrase, our mother earth. You know, that isn't just a quaint phrase. That's in our heart. That's how we relate to this earth as our mother. And so her hair, of course, or gr grass is her hair. This is true sweet grass. This, this smells sweet, you can smell it. And this is another one that you can burn in your house to give a pleasant smell. And uh, when we first moved into our house, we moved into a kind of a shack and it was overrun with mice. And we didn't obviously didn't wanna poison them. And we would do everything we could to not kill them, but by golly, I'll kill them if they don't go away. Because you can't have mice in your house, right? So I went to one of my elders and I said, I'm overrun with mice. What do I do? 
And he says, get you some sweet grass and light it and go around your house and take that smoke all around your house. And while you're doing this, talk to the mice. Tell them they got to leave. They can't live here. This is my house. You have to find another place. You know what? We were not overrun anymore with, with mice. And we never, in this for the 35 years we've lived here, we've never had to kill a mouse. Now, I know that's amazing, but that's what it is. It's amazing. I have here a little uh, basket, tiny little basket, but you see the... That's all sweet grass, all sewn together. The top is birch bark. And that little design that you see on it, the little flower is up here. And the little sweet grass and the little plants growing here. Those are all made out of po uh, porcupine quills that have been dyed. And so sweet grass only is not only a medicine, a spiritual and physical medicine, but it's also used in some of our arts and crafts, and uh, it's just a wonderful tool to, to work with. Our next plant is cedar. This is called Northern white cedar. There's hundreds and hundreds of different species of cedar. But cedar is a very important plant. When we do a sweat lodge, or even when we do the longhouse, we lay this cedar on the ground. This is a purifier. And it's also a protector. Because if you make, uh, when we do our, uh, what we call our fast, uh, in Hollywood, they would call it your vision quest. We don't call it that. We call it our fast. It's four days in the wilderness with no food or water. And it's prayer and you're seeking your vision, you're seeking help for how to live your life and what to do from here on. And you're not supposed to leave this spot. You pick a little spot and that's your spot and you're there for four days. Well, we always take cedar and make a circle around us. And that cedar is a protector and it won't let evil spirits come in because you're vulnerable at that time. Many of the old people who do that or in the old days when they did their their fast, they would be naked without any tools or weapons or even any clothes. And so they were very vulnerable and they would put that cedar around them to make sure that they were protected from that. Cedar is a very sweet smelling. When it burns, it crackles and pops and throws out little sparks. And we're taught that, that those sparks and that crackling is what attracts the good spirits, they want to come and see what's happening at this place where cedar is being born or uh, being burnt. So we got cedar, sage, sweet grass, and tobacco are the four principal sacred plants of the Anishinaabe. And I've oftentimes raised this at, at ceremonies. I say, well, if the earth is sacred, why isn't everything sacred? And the elders say, everything is sacred. And they leave it at that. So we have contradictions and questions that arise in our culture around our plants, around our medicines, around our spirituality. And the elders will give you what they know, what they can. And sometimes all they can give you is, that's why we've, that's how we've always done it. And you have to accept that and go along with that. That doesn't mean you have to do it, but that's the origin of where those things came from. So I've spoken, how long do I have, Linda? I'm not, you're, you're muted. Linda? You could go ahead and tell a story if you'd like or show us more artifacts. Well, I'd like to tell you a story. I'm more comfortable doing that. All right. You know, we just finished up uh, sugaring here in, in the Great Lakes State, making maple syrup, which of course comes from the maple tree, which of course is another plant. And we have a story about making maple syrup. To tell you this story, I've got to tell you about Manabuju. 
He's our superhero. Uh, most of the nor uh, tribes of North America have a, oh, a trickster or a, a punster or some sort of a, a character who does, oftentimes he does both good and bad. And, but he's the one, how, that's how we learn, eh? <coughs> so it used to be in the old days, long, long ago, they say the earth was still in her cradle board. So the earth was very, very young. And it used to be that pure maple syrup would drip out of those maple trees. You'd go up to a maple tree and you'd break off just a teeny little branch. And out of the end of that branch, pure maple syrup would drip. And they say that the Anishinaabe would break that branch and then they'd lay under that tree and they'd let that maple syrup drip right into their mouth. And of course, after doing this for some time, one might get fat and flabby. One might get lazy. One not, might not be going about their other chores and duties. Well, Manabajou saw this and he said, this is no good. They don't have respect for this. This is a wonderful gift given to us by the creator. And the creator made it too easy for them. Manabajou says, so I'm going to fix this. So Manabajou looked around for the largest maple tree he could find, the grandfather of all these other maple trees. And it was a great, huge tree, beautiful tree. But up toward the top, there must have been a tremendous storm because the top of that tree had been blown out many, many years ago. And what was left up there was kind of a stump. And as the time went by, that stump, the kind of the, the bark kind of grew into it and it grew, but it was still a void there that would collect water and butterflies would drink out of that and other little insects and ants would drink out of that water that would gather in the top of that stump. So Manabajou climbed up that tree, that grandfather maple tree, and he peed in it. He peed in that hole. And that's why today you have to boil a piss out of that maple sap in order to make sugar. And I usually begin this story by saying one thing about the Anishinaabe is we have a lot of stories. And some of them are over the line. And so we like to go right up to the edge of the line and then jump over it. And that's what I did with that story. So thank you for your kind attention. And I'm eager to hear what Kabibi has to say. Miigwech, thank you. Thank you, Pun, that was funny. Uh, Kabibi has been with us since the very beginning. Kabibi and her wonderful Sankofa Dance Theater. Uh, and most of you probably think of her in her beautiful costume surrounded by her family drumming and dancing. But this week, tonight and tomorrow night, we're going to introduce many other facets of Kabibi. And she's going to help us with that by speaking to you tonight from her art studio. Because Kabibi is an artist. She is a visual artist, as well as an artist in the world of dance, choreography, and costume. Could you share some of your artistic life and creations with us, please? Well, thank you for that wonderful, wonderful introduction, Linda. And pun, we are going to have to do a story to story kind of hour where you, there are so many intersections. And for every story you tell, I could meet you from Africa. I really could. And we could have such a great time. We could spend hours just, you know, when you talk about, uh, uh, about uh, the, the change and why the maple syrup and the availability of maple syrup I could talk to you about why the sky lives so high in the sky. You know, it's just, we could, 
we could just go and go and go and we'd have great fun. But that is not what I'm here for tonight. I am Kibibia Janku, and of course you know me from Sankofa Dance Theater. Um, that's a company that I founded um, in 1989. And it is a company that has been very community centric. It has been very family centric. I have a very, quite a large family, four adult children and 14 grandchildren, and we all drum and dance. And so that's very much at the core of my spirit. From, but as Linda says, I am a visual artist. To be specific, I'm a fiber artist. I'm a folk artist, I'm, I, and I do storytelling through fabric. That is kind of the evolution out of Sankofa Dance Theater that you see as me today. And a whole lot of my work is steeped in a plant, a plant called indigo. Yes, indigo. So I keep this note. You're in my studio. Welcome to my studio. This is a studio visit. Uh, and so I keep this note and it starts by saying in front of me when I work, it says note to self, your art is a medicinal narrative. Your work is not to drag the world kicking and screaming into a new awareness. Your job is to simply do your work sacredly, secretly and silently. And those with eyes to see and ears to hear will respond. And so that's kind of where I'm coming from. Now, this plant we talked about, this indigo. In Nigeria, indigo is wrapped much like that tobacco leaf. The green, fresh leaf is crushed in a mortar and pestle, and it is wrapped until it's wet, wet, wet and it's wrapped and it's wrapped with cocoa ash, ash from the cocoa pod until you get, now this is a, an older ball. This one doesn't have good, good. So I just use it for uh, presentation purposes. But when you, it probably could get a little blue out of it, but not so much. So when you crush those leaves that are green, they actually emit a blue kind of essence. And so when you get this ball, this one is several years old, it still has that vibration of blueness around it. To make a good indigo vat, you would need, and to dye maybe about six yards of fabric or so, you need about 25 balls this size, right? And so this is a, a plant that grows from a bush. This is a plant that is really quite sacred. This is a plant that is used to dye this rich. You see this blue that I have on? This is a natural indigo. And it takes, it's a, it's a spiritual practice. It's a medicinal practice. It's one that is sacred. It's one that takes intention, not only talent and know-how and uh, but intention, because to get a rich, deep blue like this, the fabric must pass through the dye vat up to a dozen times. So these are traditions that come from family. This is uh, an indigo. So many of, most of my work these days passes through the indigo vat. And let me tell you why I think this is important. I'm very enamored with indigo not just because of its color, it's really beautiful, but also because of the essence of the thing. There was a time in the South, in America, that indigo rivaled cotton and rice. This is in South Carolina and in Louisiana and in Northern Florida. Indigo rivaled cotton and rice as a money-making entity. I'm pausing because that is very um, big. That's a big statement, right? It's a very big statement. It's big because 
that was during the period of enslavement in this country. Who processed the indigo? Who brought the intelligence to make that indigo? Who did the work? The people who were stolen and trafficked from West Africa, simply because they had that knowledge. Indigo itself changed the trajectory of the slave trade simply because it could be a money-making element. And indigo plantations often had up to 100 enslaved, one, I'm sorry, 1,000 enslaved people working because it was very, very labor-intensive. Very, very labor-intensive. Now, we all know that slavery was a great, great harm, a great strike across America's forward motion. But when we talk about indigo, we don't really think about West Africa. We think about Asia, we think about East India, we think about many other places. We don't think about West Africa. And that is because the people were stolen from the land and the artistry was stripped from the beauty of indigo. It became only a cash crop. It was grown, it was processed, it was formulated into bricks and it was shipped to Europe with no beauty attached to it, no artistry attached to it. So we don't know about the beauty of indigo in connection to West Africa. I do believe that it is part of my responsibility to let my art act as a way to, to reconnect. Now I'm gonna tell you a little bit about the indigo all over your shoulder. I'm gonna show you some of my artwork and how indigo is um, infused in it in one way or another. But I do want to tell you about the very first time that I saw a natural indigo vat. It was, oh, in the early 90s. And it was my second trip to Senegal and into the Gambia. And I was visiting a group of students who were learning to use their artistry as a talent that would give them a, 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 a way to make money as adults. So a vocational school, if you will. That's what we would call it here. And these young artisans were learning not only to dye fabric, but also to make beautiful, huge batik works. So I'm there and I'm visiting these young people and I'm just really just proud of their work and, and, and giving them so much praise. And I see this fabric come out of a huge vat come out green, I mean green, almost forest green. And as the air hit it, it began to turn blue. Oh my goodness, the magic, oh my goodness, that sent chills down my spine. And I've been a changed person ever since. So that is the magic of indigo. It grows as a green plant, or that's part of the magic. It grows as a green plant, but when you mash and manipulate those leaves, they have a blue essence that come out of them. When indigo is introduced to a chemical process that oftentimes uses something that will create an alkaline, something that introduces some acid, those three things have to connect together in the right amounts, in the right timing, in the right um, temperature. And in the vat, it looks green. But when it comes out, that green fabric becomes blue. You let it get great air, dry a bit, you put it back in and more blue. You let it air and dry a bit, you put it back in more blue. So you do this time and time again until you get the depth that you want, the depth of color that you want. It's a beautiful, beautiful process. But it is a process that is not really very existent in America. 
but it's also a process that's going away in West Africa because it is very labor intensive because it is not fast and quick. And you know, we're in the world and the world wants fast and quick. So my work in Indigo is important on this side of the ocean. My work in Indigo is important on that side of the ocean as well. Well, I'm gonna stop and show you some of my work, if that's all right with you. Uh, oh, since I have this in my hand, I'm gonna, show you I do this series of uh, rag dolls. I like rag dolls. Don't you just love a rag doll? So my work is all identity work, if you will. This rag doll is more than something that you would just play with. If you look closely, closely, you see that there's beadwork there. Can you see it? Am I too close or am I far enough? Most of my work, a lot of my work has cowrie shells. There was a point in time in history that cowrie shells were used as currency, as money in West Africa. So these cowrie shells represent fertility. They represent prosperity. They represent the resilience and the fruitfulness and the ability to move on. Also glass beads. Glass beads represent strength, strength to uh, survive across a struggle. The color red is a, a color of energy, but this doll before all or any embellishment started in the indigo vat. She took a swim, she took a dive, and she connected to West Africa in that way. So she transcends time. She's past, present, and she is future. She transcends space. She is West Africa, America, and one for the future. So she's an Afrofuturist. Yeah? All right. So I'm going to go on. And pardon my back. During the pandemic, I did quite a bit of work that I felt was healing work. You know, we needed so much healing. We still need so much healing. But the conundrum of living in unprecedented times, I'm sure caught everybody by surprise, but, and, and, and hit everybody very deeply. What could I do? I could make art. That's what I could do, message making art. So this piece was the first piece that I did uh, so I'm going to grab some things and bring them forward, if you don't mind. This is the first piece I did during the pandemic, and it's literally called Cauldron. It is a mortar that I had made in a little village outside of Senegal called Bolt. It is a drum-making village, but there are some other carving things that are gone on. So I made this. It's got decoupage, but again, like the doll, it started in the indigo vat. It was painted with a rich indigo dye. And then decoupage with Ankara fabric. And I don't know, if, you know, Ankara fabric has an interesting colonizing kind of history as well. So this kind of is a piece that talks about the need for a healing element between people. You know, we not only went through the pandemic, we also went through the pandemic of, of, of sickness. We also went through the sickness of racism. And we are still in both of those things, right? So this Ankara fabric and these angels watching over. Yeah? Cauldron. Pardon my back. small sculpture and uh hopefully i will get to teach um these uh, a class next year and hopefully if you're interested you'll sign up these small sculptures began in the indigo vat these are pieces that began in the indigo vat they kind of have an alien feeling they uh, they needed you know we needed this again healing elements, healing messages as we are uh, 
working through these strange times that we in. We can all be better people. That's my message. We can all dig deeper and be better people. So this one is OBI. And if you are um, in the in Jamaica, in Trinidad, the OBI is the healer, the spirit worker. This one is called ritual walker, right? These are um, meant to be totems. They're spiritual totems and they're meant to be message makers and uh, energies that watch over us. A metaphor for uh, healing. Pardon my back. I love you though. One more. This one is called Visitant. Same energy, same energy. This is part of a collection. Pardon my back. I think I'm going to lighten up our, our lighten up right now. So as you see, I kind of uh, not only cross cultures, I cross mediums, and I like to mix things up. I like, um, mixed media collage in that way so this is paper it is fabric it is um all on canvas and this is called summer vibes it was uh one of those days where i was just feeling like that energy of of, of venus if you will exploding in heat and sun and New World Africa. It's called Summer Vibes. This piece, again, is, um, it is actually kind of a reclaimed, upcycled piece of wood. This wood, is the back of a chair, a child's chair that was carved in Senegal. And the technique here and here is using the mud. If anybody knows what mud cloth is, it is uh, literally a mud from the Mali River that has been fermented just to the right amount activated by a plant called ingalama. And when you put those two things together, you get these deep colors, these rich and deep colors, and you get these yellows. Yeah. So I use the technique for, um, for the Mali mud cloth called Bogolon, also known as Bogolon. And this is the same wood, this chair is carved from the same wood that is used to carve a djembe drum. This piece is called Mali Rhythm. I don't know how my time is, and pardon my back again. You're doing fine, you got plenty of time. I've got plenty of time. Well, since I have plenty of time, now, I don't know how you can see this, but Linda asked me to talk about the variety of things that I do. So I, I really am, I, I consider myself a fiber artist, but I do delve in many different things. I am particularly fond of the opportunity to upcycle, the op opportunity to give things that were once cast away new life. And so um, generally in periods that are difficult for me, I will literally break glass, <laughs> literally break glass. This, and, and indigo remains a theme. So this is my indigo lady and um this is one of those early pandemic pieces it's stained glass on a repurposed window 
it's got a variety of things. It's got some glass beads. It's got some, you see the jimbe? You've got, you know, a variety of things here. But um, Indigo Lady, it's part of my uh, stained glass uh, collection. And it brings so much joy. Breaking the glass kind of is a metaphor for what I can do. It's kind of therapy for what I can do in the midst of, of a time when I feel like I do not have power over a world that's spinning and a world that is, is giving so much harm and, and pain. So I can break this glass and make something really beautiful. And that beauty can like shine, literally shine a light of beautiful color into your, into a home. Indigo lady. Okay. Um, I ran away during the pandemic. What do you mean you ran away during the pandemic, Kibibi? Oh my goodness. We had been in this pandemic for so long, it seemed. We had gone from a winter into a spring and through a summer and into a fall and then it was getting cold again and we were still in the midst of a pandemic and all kinds of craziness was happening, right? George Floyd had been ugh, lynched, modern day lynching, publicly seen, right? And for many people like me, it wasn't a new thing. It was an ongoing thing. It was just a reminder that you, you, you live in terror for what's going to happen to your sons and your daughters. That so many things would happen. So I ran away. I got in my car and I drove and I drove and I drove. I was worried about stopping. So I drove straight. I only stopped for gas and very carefully then because this was in January when we were just, just, just still fearful and careful. And my daughter who lives in Florida in Sarasota welcomed me into her house for a moment across the winter. We live in a very kind of bubble-like uh, similar bubble. So I, I was one of the fortunate ones since my family, even though I have family in different cities, we were still activating our lives in the same kind of way. So we felt safe. If we could get to each other, we felt safe in each other's homes. So I, since I was working from home, I put art supplies in my trunk and my computer in my trunk and I drove and 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 got out of the car in Sarasota, Florida. And so this is one of the mixed media pieces, again, paper and fabric and a little paint on canvas. This one is called Florida because I felt so much joy being in the sun there. I needed that joy. It was such a cleansing, right? So there's that. Can and we bring you back to Maryland, Kabibi? Say it again. Can we bring you back to Maryland? Can you bring me back to Maryland? You can, maybe. I would like you and Pun to talk about intersections. I can talk about intersections. And I'm going to get us to intersections by taking us to Nigeria. This piece right here was done in Oshogbo in Nigeria, West Africa. Can you see it or should I bring it close? It's beautiful. So this piece is some yardage and I made it by um, using the ways of the old people, the ways of my mothers, my grandmothers, my grandmothers, grandmothers, that way of dye resist that goes back for hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of years and dates back quite possibly to the pyramids, right? But it is a, a way of dye resist. And I went to Nigeria 
and I seated myself at the feet of the elders so that I could be let that tradition wash over me. And I was, I did not go at my own speed. I, I went to the, at the speed that I was required to go at. So it took me 30 days to make this piece. And this piece is a message. It's a metaphor. It's a parable. And it talks about the resilience of leadership. It talks about looking at yourself as a mirror image. It talks about the cassava leaf as a, a, and, and, and the gourd as a metaphor for fertility and forward motion. So um, my way of getting us back to here is that we need all of these things. We need all of these things in our life. We need our art and the things around us to be metaphors so that we can be better personally and we can be better as we intersect and interact with others. Um, I say that because as I have talked about first people, people of the land, it has become my great awareness that we owe homage to the first people of the land. We do, in, with no doubt. However, the people that are always and most often invisible in the conversation are the very Africans who were required to build the land and the atrocity is just as deep and the atrocity is just as wide and the atrocity is just as horrific. The thing that you find in both of those stories is the intersections of the people. Time and time again, how the people have come together the people stolen from Africa and the people whose land was stolen from them. How time and time again, two groups of people had to come together to create safety, to, to, to just build. And um, yeah, I don't know. Han, I'm going to toss it to you so that we can uh, go back and forward a little bit. Okay, I'm pleased to do that. As you gave me a lot of things to take off from. The first one I wanted to mention was the cowrie shell. You know, we have a tradition or a teaching. If you're familiar with the Bible, you know that there were three years during which Jesus's life was not accounted for. That I guess of age 30 to 33, as I understand it, that there's nothing written about him. And, and scholars have wondered for, for millennia, you know, what was going on at that time. Well, our teaching says that during that three year period, that Jesus got in a cowrie shell, and he traveled to North America. And he met the Anishinaabe. And he went to a powwow. And at the end of every powwow, there's a thing called the giveaway, where the powwow committee or whoever is sponsoring the powwow, they do a giveaway. And they give things to everybody who's there. I'm a powwow MC, so part of my duties are to MC master of ceremonies, that power, that giveaway. And there, there's always a time where we say, we, all the veterans, please come up and get a gift. All the elders, please come up and get a gift. All the graduates, recent graduates, come up and get a gift. Uh, so we try to cover everybody, huh? 
So Jesus went to a power and he saw this giveaway. <clears throat> and he said, I'm going to have him put that in the Bible. And so that part in the Bible where it says it's better to give than to receive, that came from Jesus' travels over here in North America and going to a powwow and then going back home. That's what we tell our children. Now, I must add that that cowrie shell is a issue of debate among the Anishinaabe. Because a traditional Anishinaabe, first of all, doesn't exactly believe in Christ. They have a whole different worldview and spiritual view. And so the old traditionals will say, well, we don't have any cowrie shells here. That's not native to North America. You'll never find a cowrie shell in its native state here in, in North America. And so that's a false teaching. And my relatives, my elder relatives, say, well, of course there's none here, but Jesus didn't start here. He started in a place where there were cowrie shells, and he had to have a vessel to travel in, and so he used the cowrie shell. And we use the cowrie shell. I don't have anything beside me here, but we use it all the time, similar to the way you used it on that dock. So there's another one of those, those Inter metrics, you know, or uh, uh, intersection. Where they cross, yes, yes. So, uh, and, you know, I would love to do a pro, I did a program at the University of Michigan five or six years ago with a fellow who was from, I think he was from uh, Ethiopia, but I'm not certain. And we did a regular one hour program where he'd tell a story, then I'd tell a story. And it was just fascinating at how, how they crossed. And I gave this a lot of thought. And I think it's because we're tribal peoples and we have that connection to those. So it's not unusual that we would have sacred plants and that we would know the intricacies. Uh, when you were talking about uh, um, indigo, you reveal that there's intricacies about this. That unless you have a, I don't know, a very, very close connection to that plant and to the earth, you wouldn't know this. That's right. That's right. And, and we have some similar things about uh, you, won't, you won't get the result you want until you soak it in cold water, or you won't get the result you want until you hold it into uh, warm air, like over a fire where there's smoke. And so I just love these parallels and these, these coming together of traditions, one halfway around the world to ones we have here. I just, it thrills me. And sometimes they're, they're right here under our nose. You know, it's said that, so during the period of enslavement, um, enslaved people were given very little food, very, very little food. And so a kitchen garden was really important. If you did not, if you couldn't grow something, then you, you know, your family would be in peril. Yeah, you eat crabs. That's right. And, and so um, Joyce Scott's mother, Joyce J. Scott, who's been a part of Common Ground time and time again, um, her mother said to me one before she passed, peace and blessings upon her spirit. She was a great quote maker, but she said to me, one, one, during, not too many years before she <laughs> was visiting her, and she said, just kind of out of the blue, and you know, when people are, um, elders are very sick, sometimes the words that come out of their mouths are words that come through them. And she looked at me and she said, do you have greens outside your yard? Do you have a, do you have a, 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 a pot of green, a, a, uh, do you grow greens at your kitchen door? And, and I said, no, mom. And she said, well, you should start that today. And ever since then, I have kept a big, all the way down my steps into my yard, I keep herbs and, you know, different varieties of greens. Well, the, the, the biggest pot that I have is 
sage. And that sage never dies out. It just keeps coming back and it becomes more and more prolific. And I feed it with coffee. And, you know, I just, and so in the summer, in the mornings, I clip, uh, I go out and I get some sage and I use, and I use some sage and some lavender. And that is my tea in the morning. That is the way I start my morning. It is a medicinal kind of cleansing. And then in the winter, I wrap the sage into canes and I use it to burn through the winter because you can't open the, the windows and you wanna keep your house negative spirit free. Right. So, and, and that's, just, that's something that came from my people, my people yeah. out of Virginia who are, who lived in tobacco growing territory. Yeah. So our intersections are, are just profound. Yeah, yeah. profound. Well, and they go and they go and they go and they go. We could we, go we on and on with these intersections. And I hope as people view this wonderful gallery talk tonight, uh, especially people like Walt that might plan an intersection between the two of you again uh, next year when we can be in person and share this wonderful comparison of cultures. It's just so great. You're my dream keepers, Khabibi and Pun. Thank you very much. Thank you. I just want to let everybody know that uh, Khabibi is receiving the Visual Arts Award it is being presented tomorrow at the beginning of the concert. Actually, it arrived today and she is wearing the award and we will tell you more about that and more about Khabibi, her public work, her curatorial work, uh, the work for social justice, her work with leadership in Baltimore and all of that tomorrow night at the beginning of the concert. So please join us for that. Just a special note, since Carrie Wolfson led the search for common ground about the blues, and I hope you join us for the blues concert tonight. Khabibi's talk about indigo and the beautiful blue that it makes has been another intersection between those gatherings at the search and the blues concert tonight. Tomorrow night, please join us. Ellen Elms will be our featured artist talking with us about the murals that she does, dealing with issues of social justice. Please don't miss that. You know Ellen as a fantastic painter, but Ellen, <laughs> Ellen really works hard uh, to make people aware. Uh, one of the ones I stopped in Johnson City, Tennessee on my way back from family to view in person has to do with the 100th year celebration of the suffragettes that got women of all colors the vote. So uh, hopefully she'll show images of, of that amongst the other murals and paintings that she's talking to you about tomorrow night. And that will wrap us up for Gallery Talk 5 in week two. Thank you so much for joining us tonight. Please don't miss the blues concert and don't miss the concert tomorrow night when we honor Khabibi for the fantastic work she's done during the entire history